You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel and I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer today. We hope you'll tell other people about this program and where it may be seen in your area. We have three gospel preachers who've been with us all this month in answering your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. My name is Andy Brewer and I preach for the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. My name is Justin <laughs> Pascal, and I'm the preacher for the Ripley Church of Christ in Ripley, Tennessee. My name is Robert Sharnock. I preach for the Munford Church of Christ in Munford, Tennessee. Glad these brethren could be with us today. Glad you're watching. Glad to have these questions to answer. Let's get right to them. The first question, what form of church government is the best? And this we give to Brother Pascal. I joked with my wife after receiving my questions that I was going to answer this question with one word, biblical. And in truth, that is the best form of church government, the government that we find in the Bible. God and Jesus planned and built the church, and so it only makes sense that the form of government that they suggest for the church is without a doubt the best form of government for it. All clubs, all businesses, corporations, etc., all have some type of organizational structure to it. Uh, some organizations, uh, for some, it is very necessary uh, for these institutions to function properly. Uh, without clear organization, those things just don't get done. Uh, you've heard the saying, I'm sure, too many chiefs, not enough Indians. And, and that can happen sometimes if there's not clear organization. It becomes unclear, unclear who is in charge. We don't know whom to take questions to, don't know to whom you are responsible, and a lack of organization can result in chaos. So organization is essential for success, and the same is true when it comes to the Lord's church. It has a certain scriptural organization, and for it to function as God intends for it to, it has to be organized in the way that He has stated. It has to be organized properly. Christ's church is a monarchy. In other words, it's not a democracy. Christ is the supreme head of the church. He is the one who makes the rules. It's not up to us to, to vote and to decide what we believe and not, what we will not believe. In Ephesians 1.22, Paul said, And he put all things under his feet and gave him, speaking of Christ, to be head over all things to the church. Paul said very clearly here that Christ is head of all things to the church. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. Once again, we see emphasizing here the fact that he is the head. He is the one that is in control. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, God said from the cloud, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. It is his word, his voice, his commandments that we are to follow. In Matthew 28.18, we read, as Jesus spoke to his disciples saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We have our head, Christ, who is now in heaven, Ephesians 1.20. And so Christ is the leader of the church. He is the one that is at the helm. But God in his infinite wisdom also saw fit to establish earthly leaders for his church as well. And those leaders are known as elders. Uh, the terms elders, uh, pastors, bishops, uh, presbyters, all of those different words referring to the same men, the same office. The Holy Scriptures express very plainly the need for qualified men to serve as elders of the Lord's church. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul tells Titus, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Paul left Titus there in Crete for the purpose of organizing the church. And we see that phrase there, to set things in order. And to do this, one of the things that he was to do was to ordain elders in these congregations. 
obviously Paul, who is being guided by the Holy Spirit, knew the importance of having these men established in these congregations because those individuals would help to lead the church. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, Luke records, So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul is returning to congregations here that he had previously established during his first missionary journey. And as he goes back to these congregations, uh, he's working by the authority of Jesus, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we see that he is establishing elders in these congregations. It's evident that's God's plan for these congregations to have these men in those roles. In fact, it was so important that we read here that that appointment was followed with prayer and fasting. So the scriptures proclaim that there's a need for these leaders. But at the same time, common sense teaches us this as well. To assert that God would leave the church, the church that He eternally planned, the church that was prophesied about through the prophets, the church that the only begotten Son died for to establish, to assert that He would leave that church without any form of divinely given organization, it is nothing short of foolish. Imagine two groups, if you will, and this is where the common sense comes into play. In group one consists of five men. These men are mature in age. They have had life experiences. They've reared a family. And so they have some background to fall back on. Group two consists of 30 men, ranging in age from 14 to 80. Some are mature, others are not as mature. Some have families, others don't even have a girlfriend. Which group is going to reach a quicker decision on something of importance? Which group would you feel more comfortable with when it came to making the important decisions that a church has to make? Of course, the answer is obvious. We'd much rather have group one, and that's God's plan. God's divine plan is that elders be appointed in every congregation, and these men are needed if the church is going to function and perform as God would have it. The best form of church government, it is the way that God designed it, to have elders in every congregation. I thank you for this question, and I hope that helps in your understanding. Thank you. To Brother Sharnock, what should be the Christian's view toward false teachers within the church? Brother Sharnock. Thank you for the good question. It's a very uh, interesting question, especially as all the question, of all the warnings that God has given throughout the scriptures, perhaps no warning has sounded more so than the warning of false teachers among the people. God has expressed very clearly throughout the Old and the New Testaments that He does not approve of error, anything that would take others away from God and being faithful to Him. And so we emphasize the importance of being aware of false teachers. So when we think about viewing them, that we have several responsibilities toward false teachers. Number one, we must be aware that they exist. The warnings that are given throughout the New Testament, they're written to brethren to be aware of false teachers. And so we must be aware that there is such a thing. Matthew 7.15 tells us, Jesus, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They look like a Christian, they might sound like a Christian, but inwardly they're working unrighteousness. They're teaching things that are contrary to God's will. Jesus said, Be aware of them. And if Jesus said they're going to be there, uh, then I need to keep my eyes open, my ears open to what they're saying. And Jesus made it clear that there would be many false teachers. Matthew 24 11 and Jesus said in Matthew 24 4 take heed that no man deceive you there are false teachers second we must view their doctrines and view what they're doing as dangerous it is true that a false teacher may be honestly deceived that what he's teaching he is not aware of is that he's not aware that it is wrong and so we could easily more easily with this person convince them that they're teaching error if we show them what the scriptures teach on the matter. But there are those who purposely deceive people for uh, selfish reasons. Uh, those reasons are many, but and we won't go into them at this time, but 
We must view their, their doctrines, regardless of who they are, whether honest or dishonest, as dangerous. They attempt to take us away from the straight and narrow path, as Jesus describes in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. They warn us, uh, the New Testament warns us uh, of the error uh, that perhaps more than any other sin, that er the error of teaching, or teaching error rather, more than any other thing, beware of what's going on. Uh, the, and the New Testament are commanded to carry the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, as we fight against the tactics of the devil. Uh, Ephesians 6, 11, and 17. Those tactics include deception. He was a liar from the very beginning. You see that in Genesis chapter 3 when he lied to Eve and she partook of the forbidden fruit. And so we must be aware that there is error and how dangerous it is. It costs humanity the garden and it costs us our souls when we, when we agree with and go with error. Third, we must recognize error when we hear it. This requires us to know the word. We won't recognize it when we hear it if we don't know what God's Word says. Uh, we, we can know that they're teaching error, Matthew 7, 16, that you shall know them by the fruits. We shall know what kind of person this person is when we see what they're hear what they're teaching and see what they're doing. We, uh, we cannot judge the hearts as God does, but sometimes the heart is manifested through our actions or through our words. And so we need to be aware of, of the error that might be taught. Jude wrote verse, in the third verse of his book, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. The ASV says once and for all. So we earnestly contend for the faith. There's only one faith, Ephesians 4 tells us. And so we need to earnestly contend for it. And in order to do that, we must recognize it when we hear it. That means we need to be diligent in studying God's Word, 2 Timothy 2.15. We must recognize that God's Word is the final authority in all things. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all, all good works. That's where we find the truth. Fourth, we must correct the error and rebuke the teacher. And Paul instructed Timothy, who was a preacher, and, and as a result, all preachers throughout all time since then, to preach the word in 2 Timothy 4, 2. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For, that is because, why, why preach the word? Because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine doctrine that is right but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned on the fables and so we must rebuke a teacher that's teaching error uh, the same is said in titus chapter 1 verses 9 through 14 to titus who was another preacher and he was told to tell the elders that they need to defend the truth and in titus 2 15 these things we speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority let no man despise you when you teach the truth you teach the truth and you defend it and so you will stand error. <clears throat> and of course, when we do so, we have the attitude the Lord told the, that the Lord had uh, when he rebuked others. In Revelation 3.19, as he rebuked the Laodiceans for being lukewarm, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So we go to them with a love for the truth, Ephesians 4.15, but we also love the truth as well. John 17.17, 17, that's the, or sanctified by the truth, and the truth is the word of God. And so we must stand for it. Fifth, we must mark that teacher and his teaching and avoid him. Romans 16, 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So we must mark them and avoid them, which takes us to our sixth point. We must avoid them. Second John 10 and 11, it says, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, true doctrine, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. We do not want to be guilty by association by bidding God speed, which is basically to pronounce our blessings upon them for what they are doing. If they're teaching error, we should not be in on the error by saying, God bless you, because God's not blessing them so long as they teach error. So we need to have a healthy view of error, know that it's there, and know what to do about it in love. We th thank you for that question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our tract is a pocket Bible ready reference 
for personal workers. It's outstanding. If you'd like to have it, or if you'd like to have our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course, or if you'd like to send us your question, just contact us. You may write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can reach us by means of our contact page on our website. Please go to our website, won't you? www.abibleanswertv.org. You can also go to our YouTube channel as well. Just search for a Bible Answer TV and you'll find our YouTube channel. Then you may email us at a Bible Answer at earthlink.net or you can call our toll free number 1 800 436 0463. Leave your address in a good, clear voice and we will meet your request. Back to our questions now to Brother Burr. My wife ran off and left me, the person says, and said she did so because she did not love me anymore. Is this a Bible reason for divorce? Can she remarry with God's approval? Brother Burr. Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees came to Jesus and pretty much asked Him the same question. Starting in verse 1, it says, Tempting Him, which by the way just means they weren't really interested in His answer outside of trying to find something to back him into a corner with. But they asked him this question, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? He answered them and said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. And what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Well, they didn't like what they heard, and so they responded and said, Why did Moses then give command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Jesus told them that they were mistaken. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Scripturally, from those nine verses we just read, you tell me, what's the one biblically authorized reason as to why a, a, a person who is divorced would have the right to remarry? Jesus says it's only if they, are in, if they are the innocent party in a marriage that ended because of adultery on the part of their spouse, and they are the guilty ones. In other words, under the terms of Matthew 19.9, uh, your wife, if, if the only reason that she had for divorcing you was that she did not love you anymore, then she most definitely is not eligible to remarry with God's approval. Uh, she broke her covenant by divorcing you uh, and uh, therefore would not be permitted to marry. Uh, now, that's the easy part of the question. Uh, looking at Matthew 19, 9, examining her guilt in view of that and saying, uh, no, she can't remarry because you weren't, uh, from what we know, you weren't the guilty party uh, in this divorce in terms of, of uh, committing adultery uh, and, and she putting you away for that reason. Uh, she just says she divorced you because she doesn't love you anymore. I said, no, she can't mar remarry. This is where it gets a little bit tougher, though, because not only does she not have the right to remarry, uh, based on the terms of what Jesus says here, I would advise that you are not eligible to remarry either. Now, let me say this. What she did, based on the, the, the information we have, what she did to you was wrong. Uh, not knowing anything else with regard to the particulars, if, if, if all we know is what's true, then what she did to you was wrong. And, uh, and that's something that you're going to carry with you likely the rest of your life. But when you read Matthew chapter 19 and you see what Jesus said about the matter, because the divorce was not a result of adultery on her part, then that would make you unable to scripturally uh, marry anybody else either. Now, what's the ideal? The ideal is the two of you somehow and in some way, uh, somewhere down the road, being able to reconcile. Uh, that would be the ideal. However, biblically, and it doesn't give me any pleasure to say this, biblically, 
If we take Jesus at His word, and that's what we should always do. Biblically, if not, then both of you are to remain single for the, for the reason that Jesus gave in the passage that we read. Uh, because neither one of you are guilty of fornication or adultery, uh, then neither one of you are the innocent party in that regard uh, and not eligible to remarry. You see, when God created marriage, and this is the point Jesus was trying to get at in the first few verses that He spoke. When God created marriage, He created it with two important components. Number one, He created it to be between a man and a woman. But in as much as He created it to be between a man and a woman, He created it to be for life. Proponents of marriage uh, from a Christian perspective in our society are really good and rightfully so at emphasizing the reality that biblical marriage is only between a man and a woman. Societally speaking, uh, those same proponents of Christian marriage have not been as effective in emphasizing the need for that marriage to be for life. And there's equal importance in both components of that marriage, in it being between a man and a woman, but at the same time in it being for life. We should always be interested in God's expectations with regard to anything in our lives. And that's true when it comes to marriage as well. And so uh, that might not be exactly what you wanted to hear. Uh, but I feel it's my duty in view of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19 to, to, to point that out. No, she would not be el eligible to remarry, but based on His words, neither would you. Either. And so we pray for you and hope that that helps you in coming to an understanding of what God has said. Thank you. Now to Brother Pascal. How can one grieve the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Brother Pascal. Let's get that verse in front of us, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Before we go into the, the answer of how that can be done, I want us to notice the fact that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Uh, an it or a thing cannot be grieved. And so right off the bat, we're reminded of the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person just like God and just like Jesus. Uh, I think sometimes maybe that alone is something that we need to always remember and it will help us some in our understanding of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, how can one grieve the Holy Spirit? Now, obviously it says right here in the passage that Paul wrote that that, that can take place. So how is that one done? And as you look at the, the scripture, we find the answer in the context of this statement. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we live like the world. You back up in the verses 17 through 19, it talks about living as the Gentiles did, not putting off that old man. And so we grieve the Holy Spirit when we choose to live like the world, when we become a Christian and then as a result turn around back to that old man and begin to live like the world once again. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we lie. Verse 25 talks about the fact that that when we lie, that uh, obviously it, within this context, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we have sinful anger in verse 26. Now that passage talks about being angry and sin not, not letting the sun going, go down on your wrath. Uh, here we see the idea that if we have anger that is sinful, well then we're grieving the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we give place to the devil. Uh, verse 27 uh, we see that idea and that concept here in this passage. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we steal, verse 28. Now, obviously, taking those things that are not ours is a sin, and within the context of this passage, we see doing so grieves the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we speak corruptly, uh, verse 29. And it talks about the, the fact that no corrupt words should proceed out of our mouth, and uh, obviously, that would include things such as cursing, taking the Lord's name in vain, uh, telling crude jokes, things along those lines. When we do those things, it, within this context, the Bible teaches that we grieve the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we are bitter. Verse 31. You know, we, we tend to rank sin, and, and being bitter towards someone usually doesn't make it very high on our, our rankings, but we see here very clearly that that is sin, and as such, it grieves the Holy Spirit. 
We grieve the Holy Spirit when we aren't kind, when we aren't tenderhearted, when we are not forgiving. Verse 32. And we grieve the Holy Spirit when we are sexually immoral. In chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. All of these things are things that within this context tell us that when we do these things, we grieve the Holy Spirit. In other words, we grieve the Holy Spirit, and in a similar matter, I would say that we grieve God and Jesus when we live in a sinful manner. All right, that's what's being discussed here. Uh, all of these things we understand are sin, and so when we live in a sinful manner, when we live uh, according to these things, we see that we are living in a way that grieves the Holy Spirit. When we reject God's Word, we choose to live in a manner that we desire, we grieve the Holy Spirit. When we turn away from God and no longer follow Him, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Let's not be people that cause the Holy Spirit, that cause God or Jesus grief. Instead, let's be people that strive to live according to the Word of God. And as such, be people that are pleasing instead. I know many times questions that surround the Holy Spirit sometimes are, are difficult and confusing questions, but if we'll just look at the context of this passage, it shows us very clearly that one of the ways that we grieve the Holy Spirit is when we live a life that is not in harmony with the Word of God. Thank you for this question. I hope this helps in your understanding of this idea. Thanks very much to Brother Brewer, to Brother Pascal, Brother Charnock for doing such a great job today and all this month in answering your questions. If you want to see the consequences of grieving the Holy Spirit, all you have to do is look in Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 10. The prophet Isaiah marvelously depicts the benevolence of God in sustaining his children as long as they were faithful to him. He redeemed them, he carried them along, but he says they rebelled and grieved the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Friends, that's the consequences of grieving the Holy Spirit in one's life. And it's a sad day in one's life when the creator of the universe becomes your enemy. Let's not grieve the Spirit of God. The instrument of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6 and verse 17. And when we walk by the Spirit's instruction, we will not live according to the inclinations of the flesh, but rather we'll be walking to please the Holy Spirit and God above. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer, and remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.